Okay, so um, I'm going to turn it over to Kurov um, just to introduce him a little. So Kurov is a student at GW in the data science, computer, computer science program, sorry. Um, and over the summer, he worked with me and another colleague on developing the tutorials website that I talked about a couple weeks ago. And one specific aspect of that that he worked most on was the use of Ajax within the, the Django site. So I asked him to give us a short introduction um, and to talk about how we can use the Django in products, projects that we're doing. Uh -huh. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so thank you so much for the time, for giving me this opportunity to present uh, GW Coders. You have to share your screen. On Zoom, though, too. Oh, because okay. I'm not seeing it on Zoom. Oh, okay. So I'm not sure. Yeah. I would also recommend this computer the mic. Oh, no, are you going to hear? Never mind. Thank you. So, should we just yeah. speak loudly so that we can put it? Yes. Now it's good. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you so much, Professor Ryan, for giving me this opportunity to present to GW Coders. And, uh, uh, so to begin with, today I'm going to talk about Ajax, uh, which basically is asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Uh, so have you guys heard about Ajax? Any of you? I never knew that's what it stood for. Yeah. Okay. I knew. Okay. I, I was like, well, I don't. I, I've heard it a lot, but I never knew. It. I didn't know it was an acronym. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so before we start, I just wanted to make one thing clear that is uh, Ajax is not a tool. It's not a technology. It is just a programming concept that makes use of. Uh, different uh, uh, concepts and uh, languages and that's what Ajax is. So I'm going to break this down, uh, break down Ajax into small parts and then we will dive a little deeper into what Ajax is and how it can be used. Uh, so moving on. Yeah, so before uh, we start about Ajax, a little in short introduction about me. So as Professor Ryan mentioned, I'm Purav Parikh. I'm pursuing my second year graduate degree in computer science here at the School of Engineering. Uh, I'm from India and I have around two years of experience. Uh, I uh, worked for eight months as a front end engineer for Ad Curation Media. And I was also freelancing side by side for over uh, one and a half years, building web applications for various companies across India. And most recently, I worked as a software engineer intern with Normalize Inc. in California in the summer. I was a full stack engineer where I worked predominantly on React and Node.js. And uh, yep, and I also extensively worked on React. Node.js and Django. Most of my freelancing projects were on Django. Uh, so that's where, uh, uh, that's how I came in touch with uh, Professor Ryan and that's how I worked on the, uh, got the opportunity to work on the website. And alongside that, uh, I am, was a professional cricketer. I am part of the GW cricket team and I also play in the uh, Washington Cricket League here in the DMV area. And You're I'm pro in India. Uh, yeah. Wow, yeah. <laughs> it's like hardcore. Yeah. You basically were like, I'm in the MLB here. <laughs> well, not that level, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we don't know you could say. Yeah. <laughs> you should just go with that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it was like, uh -huh. yeah. kind of a big deal. My like, fortune, and now I'm this year. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep. And I'm also a keen follower of politics, specifically Indian politics. So, anyone wants to talk about politics, I'm always there. And I also had a podcast where me and a couple of friends used to talk about cricket and what's happening in the cricketing world. But now it's a little off because we have busy in our own uh, lives. So, and so that's a little tough, but I hope to uh, restart it once one day. Yeah, so that's uh, about me. Now, moving to Ajax. Uh, so the first word in Ajax is asynchronous. So does anyone know what asynchronous is or what synchronous is? Not at the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's pretty much some set up, yeah. So basically in synchronous programming, it is a set of tasks that we do one by one and we wait for the first task to complete and only then we begin the next task. Uh, on the contrary, in the asynchronous programming, once we start a task, we do not wait for it to finish. We just move on with the second task and once the first task that we had was finished, we then give the output to the user or the client. So that's basically what Ajax is. So going by the definition, we can see that Ajax, I mean, sorry, uh, asynchronous programming is much more helpful that, you know, we save a lot of time and there's, you know, no latency, reduced latency compared to 
uh, computer synchronous programming. So going by the definition, do you think we should use async asynchronous programming always? When do you think you should use it? No, do you do you think you should always yeah. use it? No, you should definitely not always. Use yeah, that's I right. never use it. <laughs> <laughs> I would break all my ideas trying to do. Yeah, uh, you. Oh yeah, just it depends. <laughs> it depends yeah. what you're trying to do, and also like what the goal is. Like, like, do you have a certain um, time goal that you want to hit, or or time? Like, if it takes a longer, is that okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So, in synchronous programming, one of the major issues is that uh, the thread gets blocked. For example, we have a set of tasks, say task one, task two, task three, and for some reason, task one fails. What happens is the program will exit, and the task two and three won't you know, execute because it's synchronous, right? So until unless we have a different separate mechanism of handling errors and this, but straightforward way, synchronous program will mostly, if you do not uh, program it properly, will lead to uh, 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 thread blocking. So on the, and as you can see in asynchronous programming, we can deal with multiple requests simultaneously. So this is something very helpful when designing web pages and websites. Because we have a lot of API calls to be made, we have a lot of data to be shown on the home page simultaneously. So this is something where asynchronous programming comes into handy. Right. Yeah. So as uh, so going by the definition, yeah, we do not have to use asynchronous programming always. Yes. Yeah, so which is better? Well, as uh, sorry, I did not. Get it. Mike. Yeah. Sorry. As Mike mentioned, that it depends on the use case that we have. So sometimes having. Uh, Asynchronous programming is better, or sometimes having asynchronous programming is better. So, if there are only independent programming jobs, then definitely it is asynchronous because we do not depend on any one task for the other task to complete. So, that's when we use asynchronous programming. And the other backside of asynchronous programming is that it is a challenging to code asynchronous because we have we are having multiple uh, tasks uh, running behind parallelly, and that's a little difficult because uh, multi-thread execution and parallel uh, programming is a little harder concept and difficult to implement. So a lot of people see the easy way out and go to the uh, synchronous programming side. But sometimes, even though we can achieve a task using synchronous programming, asynchronous programming helps achieve much better results in terms of time. How often in your work did you use one versus another? Yes, uh, so that's a good question. Uh, so two years back when I was uh, freelancing, uh, that time I did not know about asynchronous programming. And the same feature that I uh, implemented with Professor Ryan on the website, the same feature I implemented without asynchronous programming. And I have a demo that I will show you that what the difference between these two features is. It's the same feature, just synchronous and asynchronous programming. So one, uh, I'll just show you the uh, demo so that you'll have a better understanding. Yeah, so the second part is JavaScript and XML. Like every, I'm pretty sure everyone, everyone of you must have heard what JavaScript and XML is. So JavaScript is a very high level programming language that was primarily built for the web. So uh, we had HTML and CSS. Uh, so basically HTML and CSS helps us uh, show static content and beautify the website. But there was no language or no medium of making the uh, website interactive. So that's when JavaScript was built keeping in mind the interaction between the website and the user. You click a button, you see animations. So all of this is mostly on JavaScript. And uh, so another quick note, JavaScript is nowhere related to Java. Okay, uh, so Java is Java is to JavaScript like what car is to carpet. It's just there, like there is no, no relation. Though one of the fun facts is that the only reason why JavaScript was named JavaScript was because Java was popular back then. And in, it was initially when, when the project was started, it was named as LiveScript, but then when they uh, released it, it was renamed as JavaScript. And XML is extensible markup language. It is um, designed to store and transfer data over the internet. And it was built as such that it can be read by humans and also by machines. As you can see a, a code here, like you can see XML version, it's a note. We are writing a note to Batman, it's from Robin. And it has a heading and a body. So as you can see, humans can read it, and this can also be read by the machine. So, so this is one advantage of XML. And 
Also, you can see how JavaScript is basically written here. It's just a simple function that returns the product of two numbers. So this is JavaScript and this is XML. So we have asynchronous JavaScript and XML. So now combining all these three concepts, this that is how uh, Ajax was born. And another surprising, it's not a surprising statistics, like 98% of the websites use JavaScript on the web. So it's JavaScript was built for the web and right now it is you know 98% of the websites on the net on the web are on JavaScript and nowadays people have also started using JavaScript for AI machine learning and not what not so JavaScript has become a huge versatile language uh, there are so many libraries frameworks that we use one of the reasons is that Facebook and Google uh, push JavaScript by building their own uh, frameworks in angular and react so that's that's one reason why JavaScript became famous. Yeah. Now coming to Ajax. Yeah. So what is Ajax? So Ajax is a set of web development techniques that uses various web technologies on the client side to create asynchronous web applications. So uh, if you would have noticed, like when you're accessing websites, whenever you click a button or you retrieve data, if the website is not built on asynchronous programming the page refreshes every time you are retrieve data right so that is one thing that happens on websites but with the help of asynchronous javascript uh, async, uh, ajax what happens is that we get new data the data is refreshed but without the page entire page being refreshed so that is one big advantage of ajax now uh, so uh, Earlier, when Ajax was built, uh, the data that was transferred was used uh, was through XML. But now, after the uh, you know uh, after JSON, uh, most of the data that is transferred over the internet is through JSON. So it's everything remains same except the data that we are transferring in is in the form of format of a JSON instead of XML. Yeah. So as I mentioned, Ajax is not a technology, but it's a programming concept. And uh, so one of the most, most important, uh, what I, uh, you know, uh, the library or a web API that I would say helps achieve uh, asynchronous programming is the X XML HTTP request object. So that is one of the most important uh, web APIs that is present on almost all browsers. And uh, yeah, and Ajax is not a new technology, nor it is a new language. It is. In it, it is an existing technology used in new way yeah so i'm going to show you an uh, implementation of ajax now uh, ajax yeah, so this was one of the websites that I built for my client uh, back in India. So it's a you know, medical uh, equipment manufacturing company. So uh, as you can see, I'll just show you one. Uh, so I'm just going to search for a product, say SAL. Now, uh, so just keep an eye on the entire web page. Uh, and I'm just going to click enter. You can see that the entire page is refreshing and it's showing the search results, right? So this was an API call that was made to the database and that returned all of these data. And now I'm going to show you the one that I implemented with uh, Professor Ryan. Yep, so this was a website that we built and now I'm, do, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to search for something on the website and as you can see the page did not refresh there was nothing and we just got the new results here so this is the actual demonstration of the difference between synchronous programming and asynchronous programming so in the first case it was synchronous programming where I typed in something clicked enter the entire page refreshed and then we had the search results and now same thing I typed something but I did not press enter it just automatically updated and we have the results here it's the same two things that we're doing here we are fetching results from the data we are calling an api going to the database fetching the results but the difference here as you can see is that it was synchronous programming in the first case and asynchronous programming in the second case and this is what ajax is all about like this is exactly what ajax is 
that you do not have to refresh the page every time to fetch data, new data. So one advantage of, uh, can okay, can anyone tell me what is the advantage of, you know, not refreshing the page every time to fetch data? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is fast, yeah. The query is just view the database. Yeah, that's true. Yes, so partially that is correct. So whenever we uh, refresh a page, the entire HTML from the top to bottom, including the CSS style sheets are read again, until and unless we have a caching mechanism. So when you use Ajax, as you can see, none of it changed, only this bottom part changed, right? So all of this wasn't rendered again. So that rendering time that is there, that is saved. And in a way, React is also how it works, where you, retrieve the only only the data that changes you render the data only that changes so that is also a concept of react you can kind of call it as advanced ajax maybe in in a very loose terms right so this is what ajax is about and now uh, let's go back to the presentation when did this start when, when did javascript Like the big players like Facebook and Google seem to make like a big dent in the adoption of this kind of stuff, I think. But yes. I don't know when like mid two thousands maybe? I don't know. Maybe yeah. fifteen years now, seventeen years. Yeah. I think it's the role of the browsers because the browsers only recognize JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I feel like Google and Facebook, like they're like, Oh, we have to use JavaScript, so we might as well give these frameworks. Yeah. Yeah. And other reason is that all all of the browsers have their own JavaScript engines. So yeah. that adoption also became pretty good. Yeah. So this is a simple code that is from the website that we uh, that uh, we have written. Uh, so this is uh, this side of the code is just you know you have a URL param basically or uh, you know, for example I type comp so that becomes a parameter. Yeah. And one more thing that I want to show you is. Now, if you look at at the search address bar here, we could see that the SAL, oh, yeah. the term that we had typed, is there in the address bar, right? And if you look at it here, there is nothing, right? So that is what another advantage of see, I, Ajax is. I, I hate this because I'm a web scraper, and it's so hard to scrape data from the freaking Ajax website. <laughs> <laughs> the the non-Ajax websites, it's in the URL, so you know exactly what you're searching for. Exactly, you can immediately yeah. find these very quickly, very quickly, and you can scrape websites really fast. So I can always tell like how outdated the text of the website is. Those are great for scraping. <laughs> these these are much harder. Yeah. Anyway, we'll talk about that. Yeah. So yeah, so yeah. we have another yeah. advantage. Two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Okay. Yeah. So we have another advantage here that using Ajax is more secure. Uh -huh. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Steal things from your site. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so this is the URL param that you, I show you. I showed you. Uh, so we take the URL param, and we tutorials is the entire database of all the tutorials, and then we filter it using the I contains and the URL param. So this is what exactly it does, and we have a few if else conditions if we have to order it by some certain things or if there's a filter that we have added, and this part of the code is for pagination. So now going moving on to the main part. What is pagination? Yes. Uh, so now what happens in uh, websites and web applications is that you have millions of data. You say thousands of rows of data. But when you fetch all the data at once, first thing is that the page loading right, uh, becomes slower because you have hundreds and thousands of rows. So what uh, what happens? What uh, developers usually do is that they paginate the data. So you, they divide the data into patches, so basically pages. So when you load the website, you're on the first page. So you fetch only the data of the first page. So for example, 10, 10 rows. So first you load, there's only 10, there's the only 10 rows of data is fetched. Now when you change the page, the next set of 10 uh, rows is fetched. So that is what pagination is. You're uh, dividing the data into multiple pages so that you know you get only what you want. You don't, for example, I, I just want the first 10 rows. So there's no point of the rest of the thousand rows. So 
to you know for that reason we use pageant if you look on the website like, it only shows you 20 results at a time so even if it returns 50 in total it only shows you the first 20 that you have in the beautiful yeah yeah so what challenges are Scrolling that time also the like, what if we scroll, oh, like infinite yeah. scrolling, yeah. yeah, yeah, we thought about that too. We can add infinite scrolling instead of yeah. So, with that, is it still loading it in chunks? Yes, like, and yes. we scroll that time, it's faster. Yes, yeah. So, this is the Django code that we're using here. So this is a little bit of pre-processing before we move on, move on to the Ajax code. Yeah. So I would request you to like look at this code here. Think for 10 minutes and see. Tell me which is the most important word or the phrase that we use in Ajax. You gave us the hint earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's like determining whether or not this request is coming from this request or is it not appropriate? Because it's that determines whether you need to use that extra one. That's true. Yeah. Anyone on the on Zoom? I think it's just us now. Yeah, we lost our Zoom. <laughs> so we're weak. Yeah, yeah. So the main two, there are two uh, phrases that are extremely important. One is the request dot headers dot get, and one is the XML HTTP request. So I think I uh, I did mention XML HTTP request is one of the main uh, uh, web APIs that we use for AJAX. So what essentially is happening here is that uh, if the request dot headers dot get so request dot headers dot get is a Python API or a Django uh, plugin I would say that uh, you know uh, checks if there's a request and gets the request with X requested with XML HTTP request. So whatever data is there in the XML HTTP request that we triggered when we typed in the uh, search frame uh, search phrase. So when we type in the search phrase, this XML HTTP request is triggered. And then that in the background goes and fetches data from the database and then it returns as a server response. That server response we get it using request.headers.get. So request.headers.get is a uh, syntax for getting the data inside the request. And here we are specifically mentioning that we need the header from the request. So we get the header from the request. And if we check that if that header is is a XML HTTP request. It has a phrase in that. So if it is, then we execute this, and that's how the entire page is getting updated. Does does that make sense? If it's not, it doesn't do anything. Yeah, because there's no search term. Yeah. So there's no there's no point of making an unnecessary API call. Yeah. So it's it's taking what you typed in the search bar, which was top, and then it's going, it's checking the headers of all of the items in your your data frame um, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So the first part was like yeah. <laughs> the first part was right. One step ahead. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we type in this uh, query. It goes back to the database, retrieves all the data, and then sends it as a request. So in the request, there are different fields, right? So if you look at the API request, you have the status of the uh, request that if the status was successful or not, and then you have the authentication details sometimes, and then you also have something called headers. So headers is basically the data that is returned from the server, right? Yeah, so in the headers is what we have the data that we want. So instead of, get, instead of getting everything that is uh, uh, returned from the response, we just take the headers because that is what we need. So we, need, we don't need the status code because we know that if it was successful, then we have the data there. If it wasn't, then we won't have, you know, we have some different error handling there. So we just get the headers from the request and then we just take what is what we need and then we uh, process it. So does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 
Yes. My guy, you will look after it. This is the Python server side code, so it's like the server's responsibility, and I'm wondering why the server needs to know um, about the headers that, like, if it's uh, an AJAX request or a normal request, like the server's presumably just going to fulfill the request if it meets certain like security. Parameters. So um, I was just wondering why, like, the server cares about checking the headers in this way. Yeah. Uh, so the request, the data that we need is in the header. I don't have a list. No, the list of all the tutorials that match for the query that we give. Like, so when we, uh, when I type in CYN, it filtered from the database and then it returned all the tutorials that had the word CYNP in their title. Okay, that entire uh, data is in the headers. And from the headers, we, you know, uh, get it. And when I say that the, the Django cares what it's getting, it's just checking to see if it's getting, if it's getting a certain thing, then mm -hmm. it's gonna do the Ajax. If it gets something different, it won't do the Ajax. Part of it. Is this the API? code or some other non-API related code? So this is not uh, API in what sense? Like, so this is not an exact API, but this is making use of the inbuilt Django API. Like the Django plugins that we, they call it. So does, does that make sense? So it's Python because you're working in JavaScript. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only reason. Python there because it's just the Django site with Ajax yeah. inside of that site. Yeah. So that's kind of convenient because you can just write Python code and do all kinds of complex things right. without really knowing how to do a lot of yeah. JavaScript and stuff. It's like none of us really know JavaScript. I feel like that's the answer to like most most people I know they're like I kind of know JavaScript. Yeah, I'm, I never meet anybody who's like yeah that's it that's the main thing I do. I can maybe because I'm not seeing it. Yeah, I'm looking at it. I mean, <laughs> Maybe just go like, talk to CS people. <laughs> that like, is what they do. It's this whole other world that you yeah. have no idea. JavaScript is a very unconventional language compared to Java mm -hmm. or Python. A lot of things that work differently in Java and work differently in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we get the request, and then if it's an Ajax request, it does this processing again. And you can see what are the things that we are returning. We are returning the tutorials, the pagination, the page, and everything. And then we are returning it in the HTML, and we are returning a JSON response. And this is what we are showing on the web page. So this is like this is how simple Ajax is. Like it just sounds very complicated, but it is really really simple if you understand what it exa exactly is doing. So the parameters that has been that was supposed to be passed into the URL is passing the headers, right? And then in the uh, Ajax is taking the request uh, data from the headers and then it's printing in the Yes. <coughs> um, I have to go in like five minutes, but okay. one might ask my question about price script and sure. yeah. stuff like that now, right? So we could potentially just like do this entire thing. Because like PyScript can be run in the browser, right? so could you not? I mean, I guess it makes sense to be using all these built-in things, that, so you don't have to do all the work. But, but PyScript uses JavaScript. That's an end. I don't know like when you. I don't know how you works. run a PyScript magic. It loads through a JavaScript interpreter, I believe. It basically just converts it into JavaScript. There's no. Basically, I think. Yeah, yeah. but you so as a programmer, though, you would just write pure. And do something of this nature. I feel like that's coming yeah. in the future where you'll just only do that and you know, you won't even touch this. Like JavaScript will just be a completely foreign thing and just handle stuff in the background. Mm -hmm. People like me just don't know about it. And it'll be Apex <laughs> <laughs> instead of Ajax. So again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, XML HTTP request is the most important web API that we use to, uh, you know, implement Ajax uh, programming. 
Uh, so it is used to in interact with servers. And the reason why it's a dream because like, everyone loves it because it updates a web, pa web page without reloading the page as I mentioned. You get the request data from a server after the page is loaded and you can you know request data and also receive data and this is all done after the page is loaded. So one advantage of this is that when a user is using your web page or website, he doesn't have to wait and stare at a blank screen. You can render the UI, you can render everything and you can in the background you can request and you know receive the data from, from the server. This is one advantage that it enhances the user experience. And yeah, and it sends data to a server in the background. You know, so everything happens in the background without the user knowing that something's happening in the background. So that's one thing, good thing about user experience. Yeah, and this enables a web page to update just uh, without disrupting what the user is doing. Yeah, and yeah, so XML HTTP request dot response is what uh, you saw in the code earlier. You just see, so basically it returns different kinds of data structures, basically an array buffer or a blob. So does anyone know what a blob is? So blob stands for a binary large object. So uh, basically images are stored as blobs sometimes. So you can store, uh, you can convert an image into a blob and store it in a relational database. Instruction. You think they slide it on the word blob <laughs> and then add it binary and be like, yeah, it's a computer. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so it's a binary version of an image or a document or a file that can be stored on a relational database. Mm -hmm. And then, so yeah, so these are different. It, uh, it's a JSON uh, document or a string. So it, that's what it returns. The HTTP. XML HTTP request dot response. Yeah, so so that was what Ajax was. And any questions about Ajax or anything? I mean, I, I definitely want to use this in survey software. Actually, I'm sure this is probably going to be done in like most surveys because this is a kind of like surveys is what I do a lot of work with, and it's often the case where things are being displayed based on the user's behavior, right? So you don't want to show this next question until you see the response to the first one. If it's unrelated, you just skip it. If it is related, you say, okay, tell me more, it pops up. And they like things like that that are dynamically popping up and showing what like are happening in the background, it has to be all done this way at the end of the day. It's not the same kind of use case maybe because you're not going to create a database, but you're, or maybe that's just your JavaScript. Using JavaScript to dynamically control things versus Ajax. Because Ajax maybe like, is there have to be sort of some sort of transfer of data happening to make it Ajax? I don't know. Uh, maybe those your food request and receive data part, from the server. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But like what I'm talking about, where I've got I click a button and then the box pops up in response to that. That's probably just pure JavaScript. You can add JavaScript to a flow tray. Yeah. If you know JavaScript. <laughs> or you have access to Google and people have posted sure. pretty much anything you can imagine as a JavaScript in you can copy and paste it. Yeah, because yeah, I did that the other week. Yeah, I mean I guess that's a good question. Are there other use cases that people Use this for Ajax? Mm -hmm. search queries. Yes, so it's one of one of the main reasons is search queries uses use cases. Other use cases that I can think of is just like how we mentioned updating you know dynamic data. Like depending on the user, you can update it, enhance his experience without the user actually knowing that there is something happening in the background. So that is one thing that you can use Ajax for. Yeah, because kind of like in John's example, in a survey, maybe Quadrants can do it, but pull data from previous answers into a new question. So not just say, if you answer this to item number three, but it actually looks different based on what you said. Because you said this in item number three, now my second question is this before. 
So it's not just a branching, but it's literally a dynamic pulling from the prior to bring it into the next one in the sequence. This is why I use former. <laughs> I presented on some other time, I think, here. So I don't have to actually use any of these things because I only know R and I don't know anything else. But like, I'm, I'm very interested in building a better Kubernetes platform that is more user friendly that can kind of achieve some of these things. But that's another reason why I kind of mentioned TypeScript because right. I think Python's probably the better answer where you could build an entire platform in Python and not need anything else. But I don't know. So I'm curious to that. But this gives me a lot of ideas. I like former for now, but it'll have to Computer scientists would probably look at this platform and just go, what is going on? <laughs> but it was great for our project because we wanted to do something interesting with it. Yeah. The dynamic search, it just, it, it's not necessary. You could yeah. have yeah. regular search, yeah. but then you would be reloading lots of things yeah. you know, because there's lots of stuff going on. This was a much nicer solution. And it looks fancy too. Example, if you don't want to load a large amount of data at once, you can just request the data systematically whenever it's needed. There are multiple items on our upstairs page, and each item has some details, but like right now it's not needed. Once you set click on that one item, then the data is being fetched, and then it Showing the, uh, on the screen. So, like, it's always in parts. In parts, the data. It uh, reduces the amount of data that is being loaded. Like, not all the items have to be refreshed, uh, loaded. So, only the particular item is being more refreshed in the details. Yeah, another case, which I don't use it for, but now that I think about it, I probably should. So, I have a different website that um, does transcription of audio. And then it uses AWS and brings it back, which happens fairly quickly, but not immediately. So there's a time delay. So currently what I have it do is it doesn't show you the transcript. It's a hidden field until you click on it. But what that's actually doing is buying me time because I know you won't click on it immediately. Mm -hmm. So that buys me the 30 seconds or so for AWS to work its magic and send its magic back to me. And then by the time you find it, you click on it, it unhides the field, and then you think, oh, it's been there the whole time. And really, it only showed up probably a couple seconds ago <laughs> there. But it had to do an API call. AWS had to do its stuff to send me back a file. But you could do that with Ajax and just pull it when the person clicks. Because right now, even if you don't click, I'm going to fill that data which is using your internet capacity. Not a lot, but some of it. Which isn't a big deal probably to you, but if you were somewhere else in the world, it might be a big deal. Um, now, unfortunately, I've thought of that. Now I know what I'll have to do. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and hit stop recording. Final point you should not get. <laughs> <laughs>